So far, what we have really dealt with is removing excuses for our judgment and anger. And what we're going to do now is recognize, uh, we're going to turn a little more towards the judgment side. So we've mostly been talking about anger, you know, why you are not allowed as a father, follower of Christ to give into your anger. And so as we turn to the memorial service now, we are going to be thinking about judging and idolatry as well. And I think we'll see how this all comes together, God willing. So we've seen that judging is a part of God's character, that it shouldn't be part of ours, and that instead we should replace it with humility, that often this judging and this anger comes out of pride. And so when we can replace that pride with humility, that then leads us to be more like our Lord. Now what we want to see is uh, sort of the other side. You know, hopefully this gives us a little bit of a, an impetus to change. You know, we've removed the excuses, and now we really want to see what judging really is, how the Lord sees judging. So that's our goal. And so we're going to see in this class, in this exhortation, that judging is legalism and idolatry. And those are definitely a couple of things that we don't want to be doing. But I think we often do them when we judge and we don't realize it. So that's what we want to recognize, that judging is connected to legalism and idolatry. So what we'll be talking about in this exhortation is when the Lord Jesus says, judge not, that you be not judged. We're going to discuss briefly the moat and the beam. And then we're going to see how all of this is connected to idolatry. So the core message is that judging is legalism and idolatry. And our why question is, why did Jesus tell the parable of the moat and the beam? That might seem kind of like a funny question. You know, you, you might just say, well, because he did, right? It's in the parable of, or it's in the Sermon on the Mount. We're used to this, this parable and we learn it usually as, as children in Sunday school. But I think a lot of times because of that, we don't ever question anything because we're just so used to it being there. We don't say, well, what prompted this parable? The, the Lord Jesus was very careful in his words. He was very specific in the things that he said. So why did he tell that parable then? I think that's something important to ask. Okay, so if we turn to Matthew chapter 7 and verse 1, which we just read, we will read the words, judge not that you be not judged. I think it's important for us to stop here and take a minute to ask ourselves what this means. There we go. Okay, i got to open my Bible up to that passage. <laughs> it took a while. Okay, Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, judge not that you be not judged. So what, what does this actually mean? Uh, and I think that we can have a hard time trying to figure it out. You know, it doesn't mean we can't look at something that's wrong and say it's wrong. Does it mean that we have to just go along with everything? And I don't think that that's right. Because scripture seems pretty clear that it's important for us to love righteousness and hate wickedness. Now, Psalm 45 is a messianic psalm, I think probably originally about Solomon, perhaps uh, also about Hezekiah, and I think it could be both. And if you want to talk to me about that later, we can. <laughs> but you can see these as examples of faith, and these faithful people loved righteousness and hated wickedness. So that's something then that we should do as well. In Amos chapter 5, you get the same idea. Seek good and not evil that you may live. And so the Lord, the God of hosts, shall be with you as ye have spoken. Hate the evil and love the good. Romans 12, 9. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Now, I think it's impossible for us to do these things. We can't love righteousness and hate wickedness. If we can't judge things, if we can't say, oh, that's a bad thing to do, and oh, that's a good thing to do, well, then we can't fulfill these commands. So I think that scripture shows us then that when the Lord Jesus says, judge not that you be not judged, he isn't telling us that, that it's wrong for us to look at an action and say, okay, that is not the right thing to do. So we should feel comfortable with saying, that's happening, that's not right. That's an okay thing to do. And that's actually not just okay, that's something we should do. 
So I think that's important. So then we have to ask ourselves, okay, if that's not judging, then what is? What does it mean to judge? Uh, so if it's okay for us to say, yep, that was a bad thing to do, then what is the Lord Jesus referring to when he says, judge not, that you be not judged? And I think the Apostle Paul gives us an idea when we read Romans 14. So Romans 14 uh, touches on all of this. You know, it, it goes into judging quite a bit. So notice here how the Apostle Paul connects judging to something else. So he defines judging in this, in this set of verses. So Romans 14, verses 1 through 3, it says, Him that is weak in the faith receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, another who is weak eateth herbs. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. Let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. Do you see the parallel there? The apostle says, let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. And then he says, and he who eats not should not judge him for eating. So the apostle Paul essentially connects despising and judging. And I think that's really crucial when we're trying to understand what did the Lord Jesus mean when he said, judge not. He wasn't talking about actions. We can look at actions all the time and say, that's wrong, that's right. But when it comes to the people, that's where it's different. Because oftentimes we'll say, well, that was a wrong thing to do. And that's the person who did it. Therefore, here's how I feel about that person. And we despise them. And I think this is the line that we're being shown we can't cross. Yes, we can judge the actions, but we can't judge someone's character. We can't judge their character and we can't judge their motivations. Now, James does the same thing. So if you look at James 4, verse 11, notice he also parallels judging and he does it in the same way as Romans. So it says there in James 4, 11, speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother judges his brother. You see that? Speaking evil of your brother is the same as judging your brother. And I mean, really, that's true, right? When we've decided, oh, I know that person's motivation. I know what they're doing and why they're doing it. All of a sudden, we, we feel free to say, well, pah, you know, you know, that person over there, well, they're like this. You know, that they just can't do things right. You know, they, they can't toe the line or, you know, whatever it might be. And this judgment has become a judgment of character. And that is the issue. Now, I think that this is really supported by what the Lord Jesus says afterward. I think that we can show that he was referring to a judgment of character because look at what he says in the following verse. So he says, judge not that you be not judged in Matthew 7, verse 1. And in the verse that follows, he explains. He says, for with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. Now, let's just think about this. Can you imagine? How would we do if our character was determined by our actions? Right? What if somebody had to take a big long list of our actions and say, okay, I'm going to determine your character based off of what you do? Well, that's not going to turn out well, because while we strive to do things faithfully, we don't all the time. And in fact, I would suggest probably <laughs> that if we were to look at, you know, these are all the things that we've done all day, we'd probably look at it and say, I sinned that many times, right? And, and <laughs> then we would say, oh no, and my character is going to be judged on these actions, right? Not on my motivation, not on my intention, not on my faith. And we realize that even though we're attempting to show our faith by our works, sometimes it doesn't work very well. And so I think that what the Lord Jesus is showing is he's explaining that if we attempt to judge people by their actions, well, then that's how we'll be judged. And that's not going to turn out well. 
So in order to bring this home, the Lord Jesus tells a parable. Now, I think we're fairly familiar with it, but let's go ahead and read it again. Matthew 7, starting at verse 3. He says, Why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? How wilt thou say to thy brother, Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye? Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote from thy brother's eye. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit about some of the details here in this parable and then talk about the spiritual meaning here. Because really, that's what parables were about, right? They weren't necessarily about the story. You know, nobody actually has a blank sticking out of their eye. So we want to discuss the spiritual meaning here. So let's think about the details. The Lord Jesus says that this is in an ecclesial context, right? He doesn't say we're talking about some random person, but this is in your brother's eye, which could be, you know, we could be referring to brother or sister. Now, number two is, this is a bad situation. And I think that we're so familiar with this parable that we don't often think about that. You know, we, we just say, oh yeah, you know, moat in the beam, yeah, a guy's got a beam sticking out of his eye, person's got a little speck, and you know, that's the story. Well, no, that's not just the story. This is kind of a big deal. So beam is dokos in Greek. There's your Strong's number, and you'll see it used in the Septuagint a few times, and I just want to point out some of the meanings there. Uh, in Genesis 19, this is the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, and it refers to the beam in Lot's roof, which, you know, I, I actually have a roof beam right above my head, uh, which is, you know, kind of convenient here for this, and I decided to paint it yellow, you know, not for this class, but it does stick out very nicely, doesn't it? Now you can see, like, this is a huge thing, right? So if I had that sticking out of my eye, I mean, it wouldn't really just be my eye. This would be like engulfing my entire head, right? This, this is big. And so you actually see the same word used in 1 Kings 6, 16 and verse 18 in reference to a beam in the roof of the temple. And I have some other references there just to indicate here we're not just talking about a two by four. And I think that's how we often read it, right? Somebody's got a plank. No, this is not a plank. This is like a major reinforcing, you know, structure kind of thing coming out of somebody's eye, which basically means they're dead, right? I, I think that that's, you know, how we are supposed to understand. Oh, and I wanted to point this out too. In 2 Kings 6 verse 5, it, it means a tree, <laughs> right? So, so the Lord Jesus, you know, he, he tells these parables like this on purpose, right? To, to bring out almost the satire of these kind of things, that somebody's got a tree growing out of their head. So that's how we want to notice that. Now, on the other end, moat is karphos, and there's your Strong's number. It refers to chaff or threshing. Um, it's probably related to the word karpos in Greek, which means fruit. So you can see that, you know, it, it has to do with like the products of wood. So it could be related to sawdust. And so you'll notice that in, uh, in some of the newer translations, they will translate this as a speck, right? So I think that that helps us to get the contrast here. Somebody has a tree growing out of their head or a roof beam coming out of their face. And this person who can't even walk, right? Because this roof beam would be weighing their head down. So they're there, you know, trying to scoot over to, to somebody. And they say, hey, I, I think you got some sawdust in your eye. Like, let me get it out. And uh, you can see, you know, the hilarity in Jesus's parable because that person who has the speck in their eye would be like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like, don't even get close to me. Like, you're going to whack me with that thing coming out of your face. Like, it, it brings out, I think, when we think about the details, it brings out almost the seriousness of the situation, right? There is a roof beam in our eye. That is bad. There's a speck of dirt in our brother's eye. That's not bad. And I think we, you know, we have to think about this. Like, when was the last time you got, you know, the wind blew a little bit? Maybe this doesn't happen in Canada. I don't, I don't know. Because it's very dusty here in Southern California. The wind blows a little bit and you get, you know, a little bit of dirt in your eye. Well, when was the last time that happened? And you were like, ah, like, I need you to help me get this dirt out of my eye. I can't. I don't know what to do. Like, that never happens. You know, you go like this. Ah, right. And that's the end. Like, no big deal. 
You know, that, that's it. So what I think we're really being shown is the Lord Jesus says, look, you have an issue. Don't worry about what's going on there, you know, with your brother or sister. You have your own issue. Now, this is what's funny about it. If you look at Luke's record, this is in Luke chapter six. You don't, you don't have to go there now, but if you look at Luke, Luke six, and it's Luke's record of this parable, in it, he adds the detail of the Lord Jesus saying, but you don't perceive the beam in your own eye. Isn't that how it often works, right? We see everybody else's issues and we don't realize that, well, actually they're gonna be just fine. And we're the one with the issue. So I think what the Lord Jesus is telling us is we really can only know our own issues, but oftentimes we don't, unfortunately. We can't even see what their issues are because by the way, we have a beam coming out of our face, right? And so we're, we're not even, like the Lord Jesus says, get the beam out so that you can see clearly. We can't see. So, you know, when we look at our brother or sister and we're like, oh, look, they got something in their eye. Well, yeah, but we can't actually see it clearly because we have to deal with our own issues. And so therefore, if I do actually think I see something, and I think that this is really the crucial point, because I have a beam coming out of my face, I'm probably wrong about them because I can't actually see. Therefore, it is impossible for me to correctly judge my brother. And I think that that is the crucial thing. And so often we try and piece together people's motivations and we'll say, oh, well, you know, they said this at this point. And yesterday they told me this. So I bet this is why they're doing it. You know, putting, putting these ideas together. And, and I heard them once reference this book and in this book, it says this. So, you know, that's clearly like underlying their motivation. And, and we do things like this, right? And yet the Lord Jesus says, don't you realize how ridiculous that is? Like, it's totally impossible for you to judge him because you can't see clearly. Only the Lord can see clearly because he can read their thoughts. And so the one that we have to judge is ourselves. So that I think is sort of the surface level here of the parable. Now, I would suggest to you that there's a little bit of a deeper meaning as well. And I think this brings us to the real hard hitting part of this parable. Because Jesus didn't speak these words to us. And I think that's always crucial. Whenever we're reading the New Testament, we have to remember there's a specific audience that the speaker or the writer was attempting to reach. And so in this case, the Lord Jesus was speaking to a group of Jews, right? And he was thinking about a certain group. And I think that we can see that when we just go through Matthew chapter five, notice this. You see that, do you see the similarity? You've heard that it's been said by them of old time. You've heard that it was said by them of old time. You've heard that it's been said by them of old time, right? He keeps saying that. And so what we see is the Lord Jesus is attempting to take what the people were typically taught and reteach it and say, well, that's not necessarily how it is. He says, again, you've heard that it's been said. You've heard that it's been said. He does this all throughout Matthew 5. He was arguing against what the people had been taught about God. So arguing against the typical traditions, the traditional understandings. Matthew 6, 2, he then says, do not pray as the hypocrites do, 6, 5, as the hypocrites are. Then he adds something interesting, and he says, don't, don't use vain repetition as the heathen do, right? So, you know, I think sometimes we, we think that the Lord Jesus was only against, like, the Pharisees or the chief priests or something like that. And, that, and that's just not right. The Lord Jesus was actually against everything that prevented faithful religion. And so he, he comes out and he says, well, you know, you've heard this taught of old, right? So, so you know, these are some of the, the Jewish ideas that are right. But in fact, some of these Gentile ideas have crept in here too, and those aren't going to work either. And so the Lord Jesus addresses those kind of things as well. You know, he says, don't worry about what you'll wear, what you'll eat, because all these things do the Gentiles seek. So what the Lord is doing in Matthew 5 and 6 is he's targeting a prevailing attitude, whether it's the teaching of the Pharisees, whether it's Gentile thinking. He's targeting some kind of specific attitude. 
so I think that's helpful for us when we come to this parable of the moat and the beam to realize that it's told in the context of the Lord Jesus targeting a way that the people at that time had been taught or not necessarily taught, but perhaps influenced, you know, in terms of the Gentiles. So these words then about the moat and the beam were probably targeted at a prevailing attitude in first century Judaism. And I think we can actually see that when we look at the context of the parable in Luke's gospel. Notice this. This is what the Lord Jesus says directly, I believe it's before, directly before he tells the parable. He spake a parable unto them. Can the blind lead the blind? Shall they not both fall into the ditch? The disciple is not above his master, but everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. Now, do you notice some words there that come up later? Because the Lord Jesus actually quotes himself. Can the blind lead the blind? Shall they not both fall into the ditch? Well, interestingly, the Lord Jesus quotes himself later, and he actually explains who he's talking about. So in Matthew 5, in Matthew 15, verses 13 and 14, Matthew 15, 13 and 14 says, But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. So the Lord Jesus is now quoting what he had said in the Sermon on the Mount about the blind. You might think, okay, well, that's interesting that there's, you know, this quote, this connection between these two passages. But what makes it even more interesting is what's happening in Matthew 15. Matthew 15 is when the Lord Jesus is with his disciples and the Pharisees come to them, to the disciples, and they say, they, they, they come to the Lord and they say, why do your disciples not wash their hands? Why do they break the tradition of the elders? They're attempting to break the Lord Jesus with his disciples, to, to cause the schism between Christ and his disciples. You know, they want the disciples to say, yeah, why is it? That, why don't we follow the tradition of the elders? And in fact, it starts to happen. And so the Lord says, you know, well, did Isaiah prophesy of you? In vain do you worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And, and he quotes Isaiah to them, right? And he says, you know, every plant that my father is not rooted or has planted shall be rooted up. And he says these things. You're the blind leaders of the blind to the Pharisees. And the disciples come and they say, well, Lord, the Pharisees were offended at what you said. And you can see, you know, there's this starting to be this issue between the disciples wanting to follow the Pharisees and, and wanting to follow the Lord Jesus. And so what we see in this passage is that this is about the Pharisees. The Lord Jesus says they are the blind leaders of the blind. And so when he tells the parable in Luke, he says, and by the way, this parable is about the blind leaders of the blind. It's about the Pharisees. And so I would suggest to you then that when you think about, okay, what was the big issue of the Pharisees? It was legalism. It was works bringing righteousness, works-based religion. And so the moat and the beam then perhaps is about legalism. You might look at that and think, how? Yeah, how, how does this parable teach legalism? But isn't that what judging is? I think that's important for us to make that connection. When we judge, think about what we're doing. When we judge character, we're looking at actions and we're determining righteousness. I mean, what other definition can you give to legalism? Isn't that what legalism is? It's looking at actions and determining righteousness based on actions or based on works, right? It's looking at the works and saying, well, you did this, 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 you're righteous. You didn't do this, this, you're not righteous. And that is totally what we do when we judge. And I think that that is so important because we often, you know, we get up and we say, oh, legalism, bad, right? Oh man, those Pharisees, they lived in legalism. And well, we can't be legalists. And yet we don't actually think about how when we judge someone's character, that's legalism. And I think that that, you know, that should open up a whole new world for us of realizing, wow, we really have a problem with legalism. Judging 
is legalism. Judging is determining someone's righteousness, their character, from their actions. Now, when we can see this parable being told in the context of legalism, I think that we can give it an even deeper meaning too. Now, it's important to bring this out. I would suggest that sometimes we read parables as though they're fables. Have you ever noticed that? You know, sometimes you come to a parable and you say, oh, this is what the parable means, right? Like, how about the, the unjust steward? You remember that one where there was a man who, who wasted his master's goods and the master says, oh, you know, you're, you're not going to be steward anymore. You're going to be fired. And he says, oh, well, I'll go uh, change some of my master's debts so that people will like me. And the Lord Jesus ends the parable by saying, you know, the unjust steward was more wise than the children of light. And we say, aha, see that the message of this is you're really supposed to go for what you want. And in our for us, that means to seek first the kingdom. Now, I think that's a fine message, but we just read a parable like it was a fable. You know, here's this story and it has this meaning at the end. There's, you know, something that we're supposed to take from it. That's not what a parable is though. Yes, a parable does have a meaning, but that meaning is understood by saying, okay, what does this represent in the parable? Okay, it represents that. What does this represent in the parable? Oh, it represents that, right? I mean, that's how we were taught to read parables by the Lord Jesus. He said, the seed is the word. The seed that falls by the wayside represents he who hears the word, right? And he, and he goes on and he explains what each kind of ground represents. So the seed represents something. Each kind of ground represents something. The thorn represents something. Everything in the parable is representative of something else. So when we come to a parable, we can't just read it as a fable, you know, a story with a meaning, we have to say, okay, what does this represent in the parable? What does that represent? And so when we come to this and we, we read the moat and the beam, I think we have to ask ourselves, well, what do each of these things mean? What, what is the eye symbolically? What is the beam symbolically? What's the spec? What do these things all mean? And therefore, what is the deeper meaning that the Lord Jesus was attempting to convey. Because yes, the surface level meaning is good. You know, I, I can't judge somebody else because I don't know their motivation. That's important to recognize. But there's more to it. There always is in Christ's parables. And he said to his disciples that that deeper meaning was the mysteries of the kingdom and that they were blessed for knowing those things. And so for us, we have to look for those. So let's try and understand the eye. Well, scripturally, the eye is very much associated with a symbolic meaning. So in Deuteronomy 15, 9, it's talking about the, um, the year of release every seven years. And it says, beware that there be not a thought in thy wicked heart, saying the seventh year, the year of release is at hand. Look for the eye. And thine eye be evil against thy poor brother, and thou givest him not. And he cry unto the Lord against thee, and it be sin unto thee. Now, the year of release was every seven years, you would forgive the debts. And so what this is saying is, you know, don't try and kind of finagle in some kind of way so that you don't have to forgive this debt. And the way that that finagling is described is your eye being evil against your brother. So an evil eye would seem to represent a lack of generosity. I think Proverbs gives us the same idea, but now on the other side. Proverbs 22, verse 9 says, He that hath a bountiful eye shall be blessed, for he giveth of his bread to the poor. So a bountiful eye, then, is being generous. The next chapter in Proverbs says the same thing. Eat thou not the bread of him that hath an evil eye, neither desire thou his dainty meats. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, saith he to thee, but his heart is not with thee. Right? Because he's sitting there with his evil eye, his ungenerous heart, and he's saying, oh, eat and drink. Oh, how could you eat my food? Right? Proverbs 28, 22, he that hasteth to be rich hath an evil eye. So you can see that an evil eye means that you're not generous. Well, a bountiful eye means that you are. We even see this in the New Testament. If you remember the parable of the penny, you know, the, the workers go out and, and the man comes and says, 
work in my vineyard today. He goes at different times. He gives them all a penny at the end of the day. And in the parable, he then says, is it not lawful for me to do what I will with my own? Can't I pay my money as I want to? He says, is thine eye evil because I'm good? Are you not being generous? And are you frustrated at my generosity? He's asking. So an evil eye means lack of generosity, while a bountiful eye means generous. Now, I think that that's important when we come to this parable, because, in fact, as it turns out, the Lord Jesus talks about the eye just before telling this parable. I don't know if you've noticed this before. For me, this was huge, particularly because I felt like I never had any idea what Christ was saying in these verses. The light of the body is the eye. If, therefore, thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? And I remember thinking, what does this mean? Like, is the Lord Jesus saying that if we see bad things, then we'll be bad people? And if we see good things, then we'll be good people? And I mean, if that's the case, well, I mean, maybe we should just like look at something good and then cover up our eyes the rest of our lives because, you know, then we won't ever see anything bad. And it just didn't make a lot of sense to me. So... I think when we look at the context, however, and when we understand this connection that scripture gives between the I and generosity, it can start to make sense. The context is Matthew 6, verses 19 to 25. So these are the verses that surround. Look at Matthew 6, verse 19. See if you see generosity here. Matthew 6, verse 19 says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And then we have verses 22 and 23, which is about the eye. Now skip to verse 24. No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and... Mammon. Do you see what's going on here? These verses about the eye are surrounded by verses about money because the eye represents generosity. And so what we are seeing is that the Lord Jesus is saying our stance towards money will completely consume us spiritually so that if we decide to be a generous person, that's going to completely affect our spiritual life. If we decide to be stingy, that's going to totally affect our spiritual life. Now, I think that we need to recognize, too, that while this is about money, generosity really is an even bigger concept than this. Generosity is more than just giving money. Generosity is giving everything. It's giving mercy, giving kindness. Are we generous with the way that we see each other? And I think that brings us to the point of this parable, because... In Matthew 6, verses 22 and 23, when the Lord Jesus talks about the eye as the light of the body, did you notice how he describes a good eye? You know, we saw in scripture that, that Proverbs refers to a bountiful eye. But it's interesting that the Lord Jesus doesn't call it a bountiful eye here. Instead, he calls it a single eye, which is one of those like, you know, what's that mean? A single eye. <laughs> We're not talking about cyclopses, right? So, you know, what, what is this? Well, if you look at newer translations, you'll get this idea that single means healthy. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. Now, that's very interesting because, as I said, this is in the context of this parable. And, you know, the parable is about somebody who doesn't have a healthy eye, right? because they have a beam coming out of it. Now, the NIV footnote here says the Greek for healthy here implies generous. Interesting. So generous and a healthy eye are synonyms. However, I want you to notice this. Take a look at the NASB translation here. It says the eye is the lamp of the body. So then if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. Isn't that interesting? If your eye is clear, because... A clear eye would be an eye with no obstructions. And so, therefore, if your eye is clear, if your eye doesn't have obstructions, well, then your body's going to be full of light. You're going to be generous, is what the Lord is saying. And if you 
don't have a clear eye, you're not going to be generous. So do you see what's going on in this parable? The Lord Jesus says, here's you with this beam coming out of your eye, meaning your eye isn't clear. Your eye is not healthy. And so this problem when we're living in legalism is that we aren't generous to each other. I mean, how often do you do something that you shouldn't, right? And you think, oh man, I shouldn't have done that. Well, I hope people will just give me the benefit of the doubt, you know, and, and realize that, that was just a mistake, you know, that I'm not actually like that. And yet when somebody else does the same thing, we're like, aha, I knew it. I knew you would do that, right? And, and, and we constantly want to judge everybody else's characters, but we don't want people to judge ours. That's a lack of generosity. And so what the Lord Jesus is saying is this is about generosity towards each other. And so that's what we see when we look at the eye. So the eye is our generosity and it's being impeded by something. There's something preventing us from being generous in our estimation of one another. And that's the beam. Now, beam isn't used very often. I think it's something like, 14 times in scripture and uh and it's always in reference to like things like roof beams right it's never it's never used um figuratively or symbolically so it's kind of hard to figure out what it means so i started thinking well okay that's beam how about wood you know what is wood connected to in scripture and that's very interesting not obviously you know wood comes up a lot in scripture and it it doesn't uh it, a lot of times it's used of talking about like materials to build the temple and that kind of thing. So again, not symbolic, but the times that it is used symbolically is very interesting. Take a look at this. This is Isaiah 37, 18 to 19. It says, of a truth, Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste all the nations and their countries and have cast their gods into the fire for they were no God, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. In a few chapters later, Isaiah says the same thing. To whom then will you liken God or what likeness will you compare unto him? The workman melteth a graven image, and the goldsmith spreadeth it over with gold and casteth silver chains. He that is so impoverished that he hath no oblation, here we go, chooseth, this is the same word, a tree that will not rot, same word as wood. He seeketh unto him a cunning workman to prepare a graven image that shall not be moved. And I mean, that's the parable, right? You have a tree coming out of your head. And so here, this tree is used to make a graven image. Isaiah 44 refers to falling down to the stock of a tree. So what we see as we look at the Old Testament is that wood is often connected to false worship. So what I would suggest, and I recognize that this is perhaps a little tenditious here, but the parable, I think, is saying to us that our eye represents our generosity. If it's clear, we're generous. If it's impeded, we're not. With one another. So gener and so what's impeded in that generosity is idolatry. You know, it's a big piece of wood. And wood is connected to idols in the Old Testament. So I think that's an indication. Now, I'm going to say, you know, at this point, you can be like 15% convinced of this connection or something like that. I mean, if you're more, if you feel like, hey, this makes sense, well, I mean, that's great. But, you know, if you're kind of like, meh, I don't know, that's okay. Because I think that we can prove this further. And so we're going to just lay this foundation right now. And in the next couple of minutes, as we wrap this up, I think we're going to see that not only is judging legalism, but that this parable is telling us that judging is idolatry. And I think that that's huge because we say things like, well, you know, we don't have to deal with idol worship today. And you know what? The Jews didn't either. But the Lord Jesus is telling them that they did. So how do we make this connection? That's a root, by the way was inspired by when the Lord Jesus says uh, every plant that my father is not planted shall be rooted up. <laughs> so, so that's what that's about, in case you were wondering what that long, spindly, gross-looking thing is. <clears throat> so at one point, the Lord's disciples were confronted by the Pharisees. Now, we already talked about this. This is Matthew 15, right? 
And that instance is connected to the mode in the beam, as we said. However, I want us to notice this. The Lord describes the Pharisees, and that description has a strong Old Testament background. He says, every plant that my father has not planted shall be rooted up. Now, rooted up was not just some random term that he decided to use, and I don't think it was even just because he was talking about plants. Because in fact, when you look at the Old Testament, this idea of rooted up shows up over and over and over. And I want you to notice what it's connected to. Why? Why Israel would be rooted up? So look at this, Deuteronomy 29, 25 to 28. They would be rooted up. Look for why. Even all nations shall say, wherefore hath the Lord done thus unto this land? What meaneth the heat of this great anger? Then men shall say, because they have forsaken the covenant of the Lord God of their fathers, which he made with them when he brought them forth out of the land of Egypt. For they went and served other gods and worshiped them, gods whom they knew not, and whom he had not given unto them. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against this land to bring upon it all the curses that are written in this book. And the Lord rooted them out of their land in anger and in wrath and in great indignation and cast them into another land as it is this day. So the Lord Jesus says, every plant that my father has not planted shall be rooted up. And he uses the specific phrase rooted up, I think, to make people start thinking about the Old Testament prophecies that said this. And it's very interesting then that the Old Testament prophecies say they will be rooted out of the land, not just because they forsook the covenant, but because they served idols. So somehow the Lord Jesus is telling us that there was idol worship going on at that time. And he looks at the Pharisees and he says, you, you are plants that haven't been planted by my fathers. You're going to be rooted up. In other words, you are worshiping idols, is what he says. And th this shows up all throughout the Old Testament, this idea of rooting up. So in 1 Kings 14, which is 14 to 16, you see it there. This is prophecy to Jeroboam. And he's told, he shall root up Israel out of this good land, that God would root up Israel from this good land. And then he's told, because they have made their groves. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verses 19 to 20. I will pluck them up by the roots out of my land because they shall go and serve other gods. And so you can look this up. This rooted up phrase occurs a number of times and it's always connected to idol worship. Isn't that curious? The Lord Jesus quotes this idea and he essentially says that the Pharisees are idol worshipers. Then, just like rooted up in Matthew 15, the Lord Jesus says, let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. Let them alone is a specific phrase. Now, that also has its roots in the Old Testament. Let them alone. So that comes from Hosea chapter 4. Let's go over to Hosea chapter 4 and take a look at this. So Hosea chapter 4 is where this phrase, let them alone, comes from. So Matthew 15, the Lord is talking about the Pharisees, and he says, every plant my father has not planted shall be rooted up, right? Connecting them to idol worship. And then he says, let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. Well, again, let them alone is connected to the Old Testament. So just look for it here. Let's see a chapter four, starting at verse 15. Look for let them alone. Though thou, Israel, play the harlot, let not Judah offend. Come not ye unto Gilgal, neither go ye up to beth -Avon, nor swear the Lord liveth. For the Lord slideth back, for Israel, sorry, not the Lord. For Israel slideth back as a backsliding heifer. Now the Lord will feed them as a lamb in a large place. Ephraim is joined to idols. Let him alone. Let him alone because Ephraim is joined to idols. Isn't that fascinating? So the Lord Jesus takes these quotations and he says, these are about the Pharisees. And yet you look at the quotations and they all say, these people are worshiping idols. And I think it's one of those things that you'd say, huh? Like, how does that work? You know, if you looked at Israel, like idolatry completely disappears from Israel after Antiochus Epiphanes, Antiochus IV. Uh, you know, he went into the temple. This was during the Greek period. He went into the temple and he, he set up a statue of Zeus in the temple. And after that, um, you know, groups like the Pharisees came in and they defended Judaism, the Maccabees, uh, all, of, all of this kind of stuff. 
and, and they force the Greeks out of the temple and they say, we're not worshiping idols again. We're going to worship God according to the Torah. And, you know, we're going to be faithful here. And so they don't have idols. In fact, you know, the Pharisees themselves taught, if you look at the Mishnah, they teach like, you don't even go near idols. So here's, here's a, a quote from the Mishnah for you from Avodah Zarah. It says, it's permitted to do business, et cetera, outside of a city that has idolatry within it. If there's idolatry outside of the city, it's permitted to do business within the city. So like wherever idolatry is happening, you don't go near it, they said. A Jewish Jewess should not be a midwife to a non-Jewish woman, for she is birthing one for a life of idolatry, right? It's not even like, don't worship idols. It's like, don't help people who do worship idols. Ah. Those who are going on an idolatrous pilgrimage, it is permitted to do business with them, but with those that are come, or sorry, it is prohibited to do business with them. But with those who are coming back, it is permitted, right? Because they're not going to worship the idols now. You know, you don't, you don't want to do business with them before they go worship the idols. But when they're finished, then you can do business with them when they come back. So you get this idea that, you know, the Pharisees were very staunchly against idolatry. And so the Lord Jesus implying you're worshiping idols would be one of those things where they just say, huh? Like, what do you mean? But I want us to think about this. When we judge, we're guilty of legalism, right? We've seen that already. And the Lord Jesus tells us that legalism is idolatry. So judging is idolatry. But why? Why is judging idolatry? Let's go back to James. Circle back as we finish this here. James says, speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law. Now consider this next phrase, and judges the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. You know, I read this verse so many times and felt like I just didn't understand what James was saying. That if you judge your brother, you're judging the law. And I thought, what? Like, does he mean, you know, when we judge our brother, we're saying that the law is bad? Like, we're just as we made a judgment on our brother, we're making a judgment on the law? And then all of a sudden, I realized what he was saying at the end here. Thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. His point is that when we judge our brother, we've now made ourselves the judge. He's not saying you judge whether or not the law is good or bad. He's saying you've become a judge of the law. So that you are the one now who's deciding what's right and what's wrong. And so that's why he follows it up by saying there's only one lawgiver and judge. He who is able to save and to destroy. Who are you to judge your neighbor? When we judge, we're committing idolatry because we're pushing out the Lord Jesus. We say, oh, don't worry. I got this handled. Yeah, you don't need to judge this. I can judge it. I know what's right. I know what's wrong. I, I can see their motivation. I can determine this. And who would actually say that to the Lord? But what James is saying is that's what we do. When we judge each other, that's what we're doing. And so as we come now to remember the Lord Jesus Christ, we remember that he is the judge. And so we examine ourselves when we take the bread and the wine. We look at ourselves recognizing that it's us that has the terminal problem. It's us that has the beam coming out of our head. And that the situation is so dire. I mean, how could you survive that? A beam coming out of your head. Situation is so dire that there's only one solution. And that solution is to come here to remember the Lord, to take the bread and the wine, and to realize that there is no other way that we can be saved. And that as we think on the Lord Jesus, to rejoice in the fact that he can free us from this beam 
and that if he can free us, he can free our brothers and sisters too.